an outline that kind of comes from my Navy briefing days. That was when I was the coolest I ever was in my life. Um, I was training to be a flight surgeon in Pensacola, and I got to learn how to fly a helicopter, and I got to be in the backseat of an F-15 every Friday afternoon. And at the briefing, we would go through and outline what we were going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about just briefly the history of mobile bearing knees, the history of unicompartmental knees, uh, my personal evolution, because that's really why I'm here. I started out completely as an Oxford guy, and I want to reveal that as my bias. I am committed completely to the partial, as Alex said, um, but I was also completely committed to the Biomet Oxford knee. Um, and then a brief mention of what I'm supposed to be talking about and a look at the registries and the opportunities there that some people have talked about. So mobile bearing designs came about um, really in the mid-70s with the Oxford unicompartmental knee and then a little bit later with the LCS knee. And it was designed to decouple those complex motions that Dr. Lee talked about between the fixed femur and the fixed tibia. And then by increasing the congruency of those surfaces, hopefully there was going to be decreased contract stress and decreased wear and decreased loosening. But where we stand now, um, according to those studies that Dr. Campbell talked about a couple of years ago, is that very few studies have been able to prove that there's really any advantage of those mobile bearings. And the, and the vast, vast majority of data shows that there really is no support for the theoretic kinematic advantages of the mobile bearing design. So all these parameters that we look at in all of our studies, gait, range of motion, functional outcome, complication rates, revision, and survivorship, really have not been shown to be any better with mobile bearing knees. And there's a downside to some of the mobile bearing designs too. Um, according to some aggregated data from International Consortium of Registries, NAMBA and a study of over 300,000 patients showed not only was there no difference, but there was an increased risk of revision at 1.43 to 1 over fixed bearings. And Graves in a study of about 137,000 people showed an even greater risk of revision at a hazard ratio of 1.86. Um, this dislocation issue is a very real issue. I saw a couple in my early uh, experience with the Oxford knee. Um, many of those uh, issues have been resolved with design changes that have happened over the years, but um, it still is a difference between mobile bearing and fixed bearing designs. Almost in every case, mobile bearing designs, the LCS knee and the Oxford knee, cost more than the fixed bearing designs. Um, and the studies are showing more and more there's an increased reoperation rate in the first year. So to drop back to the history of unicompartmentals, and this is kind of where I came in, um, I talked with Dr. Boyd earlier, and he worked with, uh, he worked with Dr. Marmer, who um, introduced that first prosthesis on the left in 1972. And uh, the St. George prosthesis began to be used in Germany at about the same time. And the four-year data looked really, really good, 85% success. And that's not bad for introducing a new uh, component. And a lot of the reason that that was introduced was because people were recognizing that when patients presented to our offices with osteoarthritis, at least 30% of them were looking like they only had unicompartmental disease. Um, but then there was kind of a divergence of experience. And in North America, the studies seemed to be showing that there was much, much worse results with partial knees. And that's the era that I grew up in. So Insol and Aglietti in a really small study showed that after about six years, their patients started to fail and have poor results. Uh, Laskin showed that he had poor results in the journal with uh, the Marmor prosthesis. And Buckholz in the Orthopedic Clinics of North America reported that his St. George sleds were not working very well either. So in, in America, where I learned, and in North America, um, we kind of gravita gravitated toward what it seemed like we were doing very well. That was the total knee, and then a high tibial osteotomy would be a bridging procedure. But uh, in, in Europe, the experience was different. So the stiff upper lip English guys are forging ahead with their Oxford prosthesis. And just like Winston Churchill, it's like, if you're going through hell, keep going, you know. And um, they continued to gather data, and they showed that after you know the turn of the century, there was 16-year data that was showing excellent results, up to 98% success. Um, and the study that really got me interested was at the turn of the century by Savard, and he showed in a series, I think, that was about 400 patients that there was 96% survival ship with the Oxford prosthesis at 20 years. So my Biomet rep is hounding me in about 2003, 2004, 2005, and I can no longer ignore him. And I go over to Oxford, which was the only place you could learn at that time. Great boondoggle trip. I took my wife. Um, I'd been there earlier in medical school. 
and in one and a half days, and this is something that the biomech guys did really well with me, and I saw them do well with other surgeons, is they convinced me that I needed to look at the knee in a different way. And it was really with that trip that I began to commit completely to the partial. So I came home raring and ready to go, and I started to see these x-rays in a different way. I had looked at them as people who needed total knee arthroplasties, and now I began to look at them differently. And so 30% of the knee arthroplasties I performed after 10 years were partial knees. Um, and then another reason that I'm here and another reason I'm really passionate about this is because I, I see my partners wherever I go. I go to conferences at Loma Linda University and at the VA and I see pre and post op x-rays and I wonder why didn't they get a partial knee? They have x-rays that look like this. And uh, one of my younger partners just went to take the course at Biomet and now he's back and he's all excited about seeing these x-rays in a new way. I also began to be in, uh, in charge of controlling implant costs at the hospital and saving uh, one to two thousand dollars per implant was a big deal for us with the margin. Um, and I wanted to do lateral compartment replacements and I couldn't do that with a mobile bearing design. So for me to break up with my mistress that was the Oxford knee, I really had to look at the literature and be convinced that I could do this safely. Um, and the meta-analyses just really stacked up beginning in the last eight to ten years. And all of these studies really show that there's no difference. And these are good meta-analyses, dozens of studies combined together with great data and thousands of patients. And then in the last three years, even more meta-analyses. And by the time I get to this unicompartmental meta-analysis of almost 10,000 patients, I'm on the canvas. And, I no longer can support what I used to think that I believed, and that was that the mobile bearing design, just because it had been around since 1976 and had the most published results, was the way that I had to go previously. I no longer thought that. And it now began to look like, um, in this study, that there's a possible advantage of fixed bearings over mobile bearings. So by this year, the transformation and how I practice is complete. I've moved completely almost from the Biomet to the uh, Arthrex fixed bearing knee because I'm convinced that there is no advantage and maybe a slight disadvantage in some of these registries. So this is what I'm doing now. Um, and I'm not using computers and I'm not using uh, patient specific instruments and I'm not even the best surgeon I know. Um, but these patients make me look better than even I like to think that I am. Um, they love these knees. And I do, I just looked at my last two years of data and of all the arthroplasties that I do, it's 53% partial knees. And believe me, I am not overextending the indications. Nobody who doesn't have an ACL gets a partial knee. Nobody that has even a small lesion, I'm not doing a biologic yet on the opposite side, is getting a partial knee. I just open it up and do the total. Um, so I'm really, really pleased. And if we look at the registries, what I can't understand is why everybody isn't doing at least 30% of them. And why by 2020, when we're gonna be doing a million in the United States, why we're not doing 300,000 partial replacements, because I think we can. Um, and in Sweden, 5%, but these numbers in red range from 5 to 11%. And uh, I always like to comb through the registries every year and see what little things I can pick up to tell my patients or what I can tell myself or talk about with my partners. And a couple of the interesting things here are, um, towards the bottom, um, there's an increasing use of fixed bearing knees in England from 23% in 2007 to 41% in the last year. And that's in the motherland of mobile bearings. And then in the American Joint Registry, one of the interesting tidbits that I found there was that only 30% of arthroplasty surgeons are doing partial knees. I find that unfathomable. What's the reason for the variation? I'm not really sure. It's been said that they get revised more often, but the Oxford group showed that if you do more than 10 of these a year, the revision rate approaches the revision rate of total knee arthroplasty. And as has been said earlier, um, all of the total knees that we're doing aren't pain free. And I don't think that it's really fair to make these even up comparisons with survivorship data as the outcome measure of choice, because definitely our partial knee replacements are happier patients. They get better twice as fast. It feels twice as natural to them in my experience because they still have their ACL and their PCL. Um, and I think that some of these partial knees get revised because it's the only thing we can think of to do. Um, and so what I would like to see with that, those opportunities is that, that those numbers increase to 25%, uh, 30%, or even more, and that everybody commits to the partial, both arthroplasty surgeons and sports surgeons. This is one of the easiest and simplest operations I do. It's easily in my top three favorite operations. It takes me about 30 to 40 minutes to do one, and I'm not rushing. Um, fixed bearing and cementless 
seem to be showing a trend towards greater survivorship. So I'm excited about some of the developments that are occurring there. Um, and we need to make it simple and cost effective for surgeons and centers. Um, and as Alex said at the beginning, the key to success in partial needs is not necessarily in design or mobile bearings, but it's in ma maintaining appropriate tension in those collateral ligaments. Um, and then patient selection and managing their expectations really is what makes for happy patients also in my practice.